This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome all our Torah Anytime viewers. The, okay, so tonight, first of all, tonight, uh, the food is sponsored, Leilu Nishmat Adara Bat Uniel. And uh, again, everybody is welcome. All women are welcome for our Thursday night classes at 8 p.m. We're sticking with 8, right? 8 p.m. at BJX Cent- Kings Highway Center, which is located at 1601 Quentin Road. Thank you. Um, and the men's class are Tuesdays at 8 p.m. at 630 Avenue S, the corner of Avenue S and East 7th. Okay. So now, let us begin. So tonight we're going to speak about uh, the rabbis. Oh, this gets such a heated topic. I, I spoke about it this week in a different location. And, whoo, my gosh, the screaming that went on, you have no, no idea. Um, the, and generally, when you have, when you have uh, uh, people that start, that, let's say they'll say, like, I understand the Torah, but the rabbis, all the laws, first of all, let's, let's actually back it up a little bit. Are there such a thing as rabbinic laws? The answer is 100% yes. The question is, is why and how? How can we add laws to the Torah? We know we're not supposed to add laws to the Torah. We're going to go and explain this. Number two is, why do we need to add these rabbinic laws? Number three, if it was so important, why wasn't it added by God himself? Why did we have to wait till the rabbis go and add it? And number four, which is what I started speaking about, which I sort of jumped the, the gun, is, uh, you know, when, when I have this type of conversation with people, generally what happens is, is that the people, you know, they'll, they have a very, very big problem with the rabbis. Very big problem. Like, like it's personal. Like you see like they have a deep-seated not love for these, uh, you know, rabbis. That they, and, and, you know, I always, my first follow-up question is that, to that is, is, okay, I see you have a problem with the rabbinic laws. Do you keep the biblical laws? And they, you know, usually fluster about this point in time in the conversation. And they're like, you know, I'm like, then I follow up another question. Do you know what is a biblical law? So generally, most people don't know the difference between what is rabbinical, what is biblical, and you do need to. Um, well, I guess not everybody needs to. The rabbis definitely do need to. But there is, there is a difference. But what I've noticed is when people have beef with the rabbis or the rabbis' laws, they don't keep the biblical laws either. either. And the way that I could explain it is... If you're in a bad relationship, then everything bothers you. Like everything bothers you. Like every little nuance in this, and he, he breathes too loudly, he breathes, you know, like why does he have to breathe all the time? You know, can he just, you know, like just stop it? You know, like everything bothers you. But if you're in a loving, good, healthy relationship, then almost nothing, and I say that almost nothing bothers you. Because everything is great, everything is beautiful. Now, when somebody wants out of Judaism, when someone doesn't want in it, then they're going to use every single excuse in the book to do it. Ah, the rabbis. And the rabbis get thrown out around the law and say, oh, this is the reason that I don't want to become religious. This is the reason that, oh, you see, the rabbis did this, the rabbis did that. They're making it so much more difficult. So tonight, Bezalat Hashem, we're going to go and explain. Explain the, these ideas, how the rabbis, uh, you know, got this, you know, uh, this ability uh, to do it. We're going to actually quote a lot of verses, because this is all supported in the Torah. It's all supported biblically. Um, and, you know, supported is not even, even a correct word. It's obligated for the rabbis to do what they did. Not even, not even like, okay, if you want to, it's obligated for what they did, and we're going to discuss it. So we will quote uh, the verses in the Torah. So to, to begin with, we have to first go and we have to first understand... How is it possible that the rabbis added rabbinical laws? It doesn't make any sense. We all know that you're not allowed to add any single law to the Torah. It says in Deuteronomy, in Devarim, chapter 13, verse 1, Lo tosef alav You're not allowed to add onto the Torah, and you're not allowed to deduct from the Torah. The, you know, you have even um, another, another, you have actually many verses for this. Another verse is in Devarim, chapter 4, verse 2. Lo tosifu al hadavar you are not allowed to add to anything that I am commanding you today, to this, and you should not remove anything, and to go and guide my, guard my commandments. So we see more than one place in the Torah, it says specifically, you're not allowed to add laws, and you're not allowed to remove laws. So the question then is, how could the rabbis go, and the rabbis add rabbinical laws? The question is even asking, you could even delve even more, when you look at uh, the Rambam, Maimonides, in Yisodei HaTorah, in the ninth chapter, it says like this, if somebody were to add a mitzvah, if somebody was to withdraw a mitzvah, even if somebody was going to go and explain a mitzvah differently than the tradition that we received from Moshe Rabbeinu, that person is a false prophet, you're not allowed to listen to him anymore. So the question is, so the rabbis did this stuff, no? Or it appears to be that they did this stuff. So how could it be that the rabbis added rabbinical laws if it says very clearly that you know, you're not supposed to add any laws to the Torah? Now I do have to mention, this is the type of class that you have to listen to the whole thing. Um, 
So these are the type of things like do not cut or edit any of the things that I said just in those, in those little parts because you have to be very careful. It has to, it has to uh, uh, you know, flow. There's a lot of information that I will be presenting tonight, Bezat Hashem. Uh, tonight and next week is going to be a sort of a continuation on this topic. Uh, this topic is deep, it is a little bit heavy, but uh, Bezat Hashem with God's help will be able to hopefully understand it in a clear, simple, and a very, very, very hopefully understandable way. Bezat Hashem. Now, when we have those psukim that say that God should, that God said specifically in the Torah that you're not allowed to add or remove from the, from the, from the Torah, you're not allowed to add it. Yet, we have another verse in the Torah that says in Deuteronomy, in Devarim, chapter 17, verse 11. Al piya Torah asher yerucha. This is regarding the, the leaders of the generation. The Torah that they're going to teach you, that they're going to instruct you, and the judgment that they're going to tell you, you have to ta'asev, you have to listen to exactly what they tell you to do, you're not allowed to listen to exactly what they tell you to do, you're not allowed to deviate from them, not right and not left. So we have here a question. Very seemingly a contradicting two verses from the Torah. On one hand, I am telling you that you're not allowed to add any laws. On the other hand, you have to listen to everything the rabbi says, regardless of whatever they say, you have to listen to whatever they say. So what does it mean? What's going on over here? So, the Rambam in Hilchot Ma'amarim goes and, and, and speaks about this and says that the court, the Sanhedrin for example, has authority to issue a decree to forbid something that it is for, permitted. Uh, but what are we going to do? How could they do that? How could they forbid something that's permitted if we say we're not allowed to add things? So where is this, the, the biblical law that you're not allowed to add to the Torah? What does that mean? A lot of people don't understand the, the idea behind this. What it means is, is that you're not allowed to go, you're not allowed to add a law to the Torah and say this is from the Torah. For, so, for example, you would be able to add on a rabbinical law that is 100% allowed. You're allowed to add on a rabbinical law, but say this is a rabbinical law. You cannot add a, a law and say this is, for, this is learned from the Torah based on this and this, uh, you know, psukim that we have over here. Now, how do we explain this? What is differentiation here? So let's, let's try to, to explain this uh, to make it very simple and very clear. When you look at Christians, for example, the Christians, they completely abolish the entire Torah. The entire Torah says, in, that is removing from the biblical law. They're saying this is no longer applicable, that is removing from the, from the, actual, uh, uh, from the actual laws of the Torah. However, uh, and they also add stuff. They add one big thing, now you have to believe in the Messiah. Where does it say you have to believe in the Messiah? Otherwise you're not going to go, this is something that they added. So this is something that they're adding and they're saying that this is directly from God, this is directly from the, uh, I don't know whether they quote it from the, you know, from the, from the Torah, from the Old Testament or not, but regardless, this is adding or removing to the Torah. What does it mean when the rabbis are adding things and why is that allowed? So let's use an example of a pasuk in Exodus, chapter 23, verse 19. There is a prohibition that you are not allowed to cook a kid in its mother's milk. Now a kid over here is not referring to a child because you should never cook a kid uh, in no one's milk, uh, ever. Or no, you know what, never cook a kid. That should be the end of the sentence right there. However, this over here we're talking about a baby goat. Right? So you're not allowed to cook a baby goat in its mother's milk. Now that is what the Pasuk says in the, in the, uh, in the Torah. Now if Bedin would come and say, you know what, no, you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to cook a baby in its mother's milk. A baby goat in its mother's milk. Very important to emphasize that. You're allowed to do that. That is removing from the Torah. Now let's say, according to the biblical understanding, the, uh, the biblical law, according to the biblical law, poultry, uh, fowl, you know, like uh, chicken, turkey, all those uh, different types of, of, uh, of food that we eat, biblically, you're allowed to eat that with milk. You're allowed to eat, you know, those type of whatever, those things, things you're allowed to do. The rabbi said, you know, you're not allowed to. But, before we get to that, if the rabbis would come and say, biblically, you're not allowed to eat chicken with milk. You're not allowed to cook chicken with milk. That is adding to the Torah. But, if the rabbis come and they say, biblically, you're not allowed to cook a kid with its mother's milk. Rabbinically, we are adding on an additional prohibition that you're not allowed to cook not chicken, not turkey, not anything else with milk. That is okay. Now the question is, why? Why do that? Why make it more difficult? Wouldn't it be a lot easier if everybody could have chicken, cheese, burgers? That makes sense, yeah. Like, why did the rabbis need to do this? So, the rabbis did it for a few reasons. First of all, they didn't just do it because they were like bored one time. They were sitting on their thrones and they were like, you know, like, let's make things a little bit more difficult, shall we? Uh, yes, what can we make the peasants' lives be more difficult? It wasn't like something that they were looking to make it more difficult. They, this is based off empirical data. They actually saw that the people were making mistakes. They didn't know the difference between chicken and, and meat. They didn't know the difference. They weren't able to tell the difference. They saw that people were eating this, and that was okay. But then they were also stretching and saying, okay, this was also okay. And they started eating things that was biblically prohibited. So the rabbis started saying, listen, we can't do this. We, can't, we, have, to, we have to prevent them from, ha- from, from this from happening. Hence, any meat, because of the confusion that's going to happen, anything that's related to chicken, anything that's related to meat, you're not allowed to cook it with milk, you're not allowed to eat it with milk, you're not allowed to eat those two things together. Furthermore, 
somebody could do an analysis, a false analysis, but an analysis nonetheless, that says, okay, look, the Torah says like this. The Torah says that you're not allowed to cook a baby goat in its mother's milk. Now, they'll say, okay, a baby goat in its mother's milk you can't cook. But what about a baby goat or adult goat or whatever? Yeah, adult goat, that's a good thing. A adult goat with somebody else's milk. Or a baby goat with his aunt's milk. With somebody else, not his mother's milk. Maybe that's allowed. And uh, maybe they'll say, okay, it only says a goat. So maybe every other undomesticated animal I could also eat with milk. It's just specifically the goat. So people will start stretching this out and they'll, they'll actually eat things that are forbidden biblically. So the rabbi said, the rabbi instituted a law saying that you're not allowed to do it, nothing to, to prevent people from doing this, these problems. From, to prevent people from actually uh, uh, committing these sins, which was a problem uh, during that time. It, this, you, you think of it like a fence. Somebody, um, you're driving in the street and you're in Brooklyn, so you can attest to this very, very uh, often, uh, there is a pothole in the street. And some people actually get flat tires from the potholes. Now imagine someone comes and puts a little gate around the pothole. Are you going to be like, come on, dude. Like, why do you have to put a gate over there? Like, why do you? I'm like, what, are you serious? It's for your benefit, so you don't get a flat tire. Of course you would put a gate. You wouldn't go to that person and say, oh, you're, doing, you're, you're so annoying. Like, now we have to work, drive even further. I'm like, yeah, because it's a, it's a gate. It's a, you know, they're there for a reason, because there's something, there's a, you know, something you know, dangerous on the other side. Think of it as this scenario. Say you have a kid, and you love this kid. Uh, unfortunately, I have to add that these days. Right? Say you have a kid, and you love, and you love this, this child. And for some odd reason, you live next to a nuclear power plant. Um, and this nuclear power plant, you cannot stand within 50 meters from the nuclear power plant because of radioactive you know, activity. You don't want to have any problems. 50 yards, that's where it's safe. After that, it's okay. You have a little child that, that's going and playing around. You tell the child, 100 yards. You see this line that I'm just drawing right now? You're not going anything over here. Now somebody would have to be like, that's not fair. The child, as is, he's living next to a nuclear power plant. Let him play a little bit more. Why do you have to go and add so much more, you know, lines to it that now he can't even go 100 feet close to the nuclear power plant? You're, 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 you're suffocating him. What's going on? But yet, any normal person will say, no, that's a smart parent. That's a parent that loves a child. That's a parent that cares for the child, that wants the best for the child. Says, hey, listen, I don't want to even take any chances. I don't want you going even 100 meters close to this, uh, close to this uh, you know, nuclear power plant. When we look at the, the rabbi's prohibition, there's two ways to look at it. There's like, oh man, what are they doing? Making life more difficult? Or they're protecting something that is very, very vital that needs protection. Like a baby's life. The idea over here, so if we could summarize the, the, the facts that we have until now. The prohibition of adding laws to the Torah is only if you add laws to the Torah. Which means is you're adding laws and saying this is a biblical law you're not allowed to do. But if the rabbis are adding fences and say, listen, this, biblically you're allowed to do it. Rabbinically, you're not, you're not allowed to do it for X, Y, and Z, whatever the reason that they give. If they give a reason, whatever it is, they, they place over there. That is not a problem according to, the, um, according to the Torah. Good so far? Okay, good. Now, let's look. We already brought in some sources. We're also going to bring some for, uh, uh, additional sources for, for the rabbi's obligation to do this. There is a Gemara in Moed Katan, page 5a. Marzutra says like this. He says that we learned this from a pasuk in Leviticus, chapter 15, verse 31. It says, et bnei You have to separate, you have to warn the children from their uncleanliness. Meaning that you have to prevent them, you have to warn them to stay away from anything that will make them impure, from anything that will make them sin, from anything that will be a problematic. You have to warn them to stay away from it. Rav Ashi says, no, we learn it from a different verse in Leviticus chapter 18, verse 30. You have to safeguard my charge. I give you a commandment, safeguard it. How do you safeguard a commandment? If someone gives you something and say, hey, listen, I want you to keep this safe. What are you going to do? You're not going to put it on display. You put it in a safe. You know, literally, that's why it's called a safe. To keep some people things. You keep things fence. You keep things and protect it. How do you protect something that you've protected by, by placing some sort of protection barrier, uh, you know, on the outside of it? The... The idea behind this is that if you, in order to preserve the Torah for thousands and thousands of years, this was very necessary. It was necessary for the rabbis to have the ability, to have the power to go and to institute the laws, to institute the decrees, because there would come a time where, well, let's say, things are different than they used to be when the Torah was given. Because technology is always changing, times are always changing. So what are you going to do with this law? What are you going to do with this law? There needed to be an authority that could tell you this is okay, this is not okay. And this authority was given to the rabbis there, uh, you know, already there, actually since the beginning of time, since the, since, the, the, since the Torah was given. The, not only was it a, it, it was this said and mentioned in the Torah, it is a positive commandment. It's, a, it's a, literally enough that you go and you, and you ask a question to a Torah scholar to go and find out what you need. And this is based off a pasuk, another pasuk in Leviticus chapter 10 verse 11. لَغَوْتْ et بِنَيْ إِسْرَالْ أَتْ كُلَ حُكِيمْ أَشَرْ دِبَرْ أَشَمْ أَلَكَمْ بَيَادْ مَشَرْ To go and instruct 
all the Jewish people by the by the laws of God. This is what this is the obligation. This is the this is the requirement of the rabbis that they need to go and they need to instruct it. And this is a positive. Uh, this is a positive commandment. The the Rambam goes and says on a, a pasuk that we mentioned earlier that. Um, that he learns, where do we know that this is a positive commandment? From, cha- for Deval- from Devalim, chapter 17, verse 11, that says that you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to deviate from whatever they tell you, not right and not left. Meaning that this, this Torah commands us that this is a, that if you go, and if you violate what the rabbis are telling you, that's actually you're violating a negative biblical commandment. Because it says specifically in the Torah that you have to go and you have to listen to what the rabbis say. Now, the... Um, when you look at what the rabbis instituted, all the laws of the rabbis instituted, you know, people think, okay, well, there's like hundreds and hundreds of different laws that the rabbis instituted. There's actually, there's a lot of fences that the rabbis instituted, but the bottom line laws, you can practically bring it down to a total whopping number of, anybody know? Guess? Seven. Seven laws. Seven laws of the rabbis instituted. Yep. Well, there's a lot of fences, but laws specifically. Let's, let's go and explain what these laws are. So number one, um, that's why when people have a big problem with rabbinical laws, uh, and I ask him, can you name me a rabbinical law? They usually can't, because they have an idea, with the, they, have a, they have a problem with the concept. But the, the biggest problem in our generation is there is a lack of knowledge. People don't know. People get angry at stuff. People just are, are like angry people. Right? I, I mean, maybe that's just because I live in Brooklyn and I drive in Brooklyn, so that's why I feel that way. But people sometimes get angry very, very easily. And a lot of times they don't know what they're angry. Sometimes people, you have a, you have a couple that are there in a fight. You, you know, they, some of them don't, don't even remember what they're fighting about. And you could see when you ask them, okay, so what's the problem? Well, you know, uh, you know she, like six years ago, uh, she, uh, you know, she did something. Like, you know, they don't even know what they're arguing about. But what? There's ego involved. There's, a, you know, there's all this kind of this. So you get involved in an argument, you just continue with it. The same thing in Judaism. People get angry at God or whatever reason that they're getting angry at that. And they just want to, like, just have a reason to go. And they don't actually know the, the bottom line and things. The... So let's look at these seven uh, rabbinic mitzvahs. Number one is uh, the, the obligation to say halal. So say, we say halal, we say this on Pesach, on Shavuot, on Simchat Torah, we have Hanukkah, you know, we have different holidays, we have also on, hal- uh, on Rosh Chodesh, so we say, this is when you say uh, halal. Number, that's number one, right? Not that difficult, right? If you pray, you know, that's what are you talking about? Like two, three minutes, right? That it takes you. Number two, number two in the big list of the rabbis is you need to make a blessings. Brachot, you have to make a blessing before. It's not only before food and after food, it's also if you hear or see things or smell things. Um, let's say you hear lightning, see thunder. So number three. Number three, so that's number two. Number three, uh, this is a very difficult one. Very difficult, so you know, hold your horses over here. Washing your hands before eating bread. Oh, yeah, I know, it's oh, crazy, right? Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's also a bracha, so... No, it's washing your hands. Well, you make a bracha until the time, but I'm saying this is also a, a bracha for, an obligation that you do before wash, eating bread. Number four is a roof. There are three types of a roof. A roof is, uh, there you have the roof, for example, on Shabbat, that you are able to go and carry in a, in a public place. They turn it into... Uh, do we have the time to go into the details of this? No. Okay, so that's Eruv number one. Number, Eruv number two is Eruv Tchumim. Is, this is the, the Eruv that you're not allowed to go outside of a Tchum, outside of a, uh, of a city, um, 2,000 amot, 2,000 cubits. What's that? You're looking at, I don't know, three to 4,000 feet. That's number, where are we? Number two. Number three is Eruv Tavshilin. Eruv Tavshilin, so we know that on Yom Tov you could cook. On Shabbat you can't cook. On Yom Tov you could only cook for Yom Tov. On Shabbat, you can't cook regardless. But what happens if Yom Tov falls out on very cl- you know, and it follows with Shabbat? So you are not allowed to cook on Yom Tov to prepare for Shabbat. There is something called a Yom Tov that you're able to go and you're able to cook on Yom Tov for Shabbat. The way that you do this, being that you have so many questions, let me just give you the answer right now for this uh, on these things. That that you have the a uh, the, the way it works is that you start cooking to you, you start cooking already before before Yom Tov on this, and you keep these two food items on the side. This is for, you save it for Shabbat, which means that you already began the process of the cooking. So now that you're cooking on Yom Tov, you're not doing anything new. You're just continuing the process that you already started before, and then hence that is okay and that is not a problem. This is the eruv. Uh, uh, that, we, that we do. So this is the fourth uh, rabbinical... What about like the rules like, like Shomani Kiya or like rules on Shabbat? Like, 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 um, that's, so that's fences. So that's we're dealing with fences. Okay. Question is uh, Shomani Kiya, is that rabbinic or, or biblical? It's actually Mahlokot. So Mahlokot is Rambam and, and Ramban. So, um, okay. Anyways, the Shabbat candles. Um, 
the Shabbat candles. That's number five, right? So we're saying the, the rabbis instituted that, 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 that uh, you know, and now it's, it falls on the Jewish woman, but technically if there's no woman in the house and there's only a man in the house, man lights the candles, you light uh, candles for Shabbat. The reason for this originally was because that there should be light on the house. Whenever there's darkness and people trip over things, you know, it doesn't become so nice and cozy and dandy, so there was an obligation to go and to put the candles. Nowadays, even though we have lights and we, even have, we still have the obligation to light the candles. Number six is the, the mitzvot of Purim. So we know in 300 55 BCE, before Common Era, there was a holiday, there was a holiday instituted of Purim because we were saved from Haman Rasha, and we do certain things, we read the Megillah, we give, you know, Matanat Levianim, we give uh, uh, food to the, uh, well, money to the poor, or food to the poor, and we give, uh, you know, two food items to, a, you know, to a friend, and things like that, and so on and so forth, that is the sixth one. The seventh one is Hanukkah. The thing of Hanukkah, which happened on 139 BCE, the, uh, the Maccabees, uh, you know, took over the, the, um, the Greeks, and we got back to the temple, and you know, this is where we found the oil, and we light uh, the Hanukkah menorah, we say halal, and so on and so forth. Spinning the dreidel is not an obligation, just so that you know, eating uh, oiled stuff is also not an obligation. You don't have to cause yourself diabetes, or any other congestive, uh, you know, or heart failures, or anything else like that. That is, uh, you know, a lot of people think, you know, like this is an obligation. You know what it is, it's very interesting also, is that... Um, People have the disease of obesity and they blame it on Baal Tashvis. They're like, well, you know, I just can't, it's Baal Tashvis. No, just, you know, put the fork down, you know, relax. It's not, you know, you, you have an obligation to shmaltim od nafsh techem. You have to guard your, your you know, your, your bodies um, and not just stuff it every five minutes. Okay, so now, I can say that because I'm an American. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, all right. <clears throat> the Rambam. The Maimonides in Hilchot Mamarim, in the second chapter, says like this. says, when the rabbis instituted a decree, how are they able to institute a decree? They are only able to institute a decree only when there is the majority of the community going to be able to uphold the decree. Which means is, is if they want to institute a decree, and the majority of the people are not going to be able to do it, it's going to be too difficult, the decree does not get passed. I, do know what, I don't know why I raised my hand. Um, <laughs> is that the thing with the Syrians, how like, they're not allowed to marry converts and stuff? Is that... No, that's for a different reason uh, in its entirety, but we'll, we, we could speak about that if you want afterwards. Um, well, can we? Um, uh, whatever, okay. <laughs> now that I have a, whatever, okay. So anyways, uh, then what happened, follow up, the, the next uh, halakha, the Rambam goes like this. Say the courts establish a certain rule. They establish a certain uh, rabbinical law, and they thought that all the people are going to be able to uphold it. But then they see that the people are not able to uphold it. They're having problems upholding it. It's being very difficult. The, the, law, gets, uh, the law gets nullified, the decree gets nullified, and, doesn't get, and it, it's no longer applicable. So we see over here something very important. The rabbis don't just pass things willy-nilly. They only pass things that people are able to hold, and there is, oh, has to be, you know, there's a very good reason why things get passed for that. The rabbinical portion of halacha falls into three groups. There's something called gzera, there's something called takana, and there's something called minhag, or minhagim. Let's try to go explain what the difference between these three things, and try to clarify these, uh, these ideas. Okay, so um, a lot of these, um, especially the Xelot, these laws were enacted to cure a specific problem that was happening. So for example, there's a Gemara in Gitin, page 17a, that the rabbis required dating of a get. So a get is a bill of divorce, a... Uh, well, that's pretty much explains it. Divorce papers. Yeah. Um, they require dating of it. Originally, they didn't need dating. But what they saw, they saw that, let's say somebody, his wife committed adultery. For whatever reason, he didn't, you know, he still loved her and he still, you know, didn't want her to get, uh, you know, the, the severe punishments of the related that. So he gave her a get, a, a bill of divorce, but he backdated it, you know, afterwards or something like that to before she committed the adultery. So he gave her, she was really a married woman when she committed the adultery, but he, because of whatever reasons, he wanted to give her a get that backdated it, which you can't do. And therefore, the rabbi saw that to so the institute, you know what, now you have to date it, and every time you have to date it, and we have to see the date, because we have to know exactly when it's given to, to, uh, to make sure that this doesn't happen. You have also, for example, uh, biblically, taking a hot bath on Shabbat is allowed. But what happened? The, back then, there were bath houses, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's the right terminology. They had bath houses and bath attendants. And they, the only time that you would be allowed to take a hot bath on Shabbat is if obviously the water was heated prior to Shabbat. You're not allowed to heat water on Shabbat. But what they saw was that these bath attendants were heating water on Shabbat. So they said, okay, you see, we see that there's a problem over here, you know, and from now on, you're not allowed to even take hot baths on, you're not allowed to take a bath on a Shabbat uh, for that reason. So, the, the, so we look at it, the, the, 
Takanot are positive enactments that are made to protect the principles of the Torah. The Gzerot are negative enactments that are decreed to prevent, the, think of it like fences, that's the easiest thing, to prevent uh, breaches in the Torah. So, for example, uh, Gzera. The Gzera is, that we gave before, is eating poultry. For exa- the, we said that from the Torah, you're allowed to eat poultry with, with uh, dairy. But rabbinically, they went and said you're not allowed to. Why? Because they saw that it was a problem, so they are enacting a fence. That's a gzera. That's something we call a gzera. Another a gzera is, biblically, chametz is not allowed to be eaten, not allowed to be in possession from chatzot, from the Erev Pesach, from the, day before, from the day before Pesach, from midday and on, you're not allowed to have any more chametz. The rabbis instituted two hours beforehand, you know, for, you know, for certainty, you have two hours, if it's a cloudy day, whatever, there's certain reasons, they said, you know, you're going to have it for two hours beforehand. That is a uh, gzera. And by the way, there's no difference between a gzera and a Torah. Both of these are forbidden to, to violate, you're not allowed to go, you know, against these things. The diff- there are, you know, two main differences. Number one, the punishment. The punishment of a rabbinical decree. Let's say somebody violated Shabbat. If it was a rabbinical decree, that is punishable by, by lashes only. If it's a biblical decree, that is punishable by death. So obviously there's a difference in punishment. There's also another difference regarding uh, if you, let's say, you're in doubt. If, so if, let's say, you're uncertain if, let's say, you did a certain mitzvah. If it's a biblical mitzvah, you have to do it again. If it's a rabbinical mitzvah, you don't have to. So some example, let's say it's feeling. Feeling is a biblical mitzvah. So if you're uncertain, or if you're uncertain if, let's say, it was kosher, well, not you, but men, right? The weird feeling, right? If they're uncertain that, yes, I'm speaking to the woman on the wall, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. So um, if you're uncertain, if you're going, and if you're, if you're, where, if you're the, co- the film was kosher, if you wore it or not, you have to put it on again. But let's say washing of the hands. Wash, if you're uncertain, if you wash your hands, you don't have to go and wash again. Rabbinical, if you're uncertain, you don't have to go and, and do it again. That is Xerot, Takanot. Takanot was meant to enhance the communal life. An example of this was the candles of Hanukkah. Oh, oh, very good question. Excellent question. The question was, why do we have to repeat um, if, let's say, we forgot certain additions in the, um, in the prayers? Whether it is, you know, whatever it is, you know, different things, if different things during the, during the prayers, if you forget, you have to repeat. Now, why is that? If you don't have to repeat, excellent question, thank you. If you don't have to repeat uh, if you're uncertain for something, then how come you have to repeat if you forget certain, certain things in the additions to the prayers? Yeah. So the answer for that is, is not because, uh, it's very actually fascinating, uh, you know, understanding this. If let's say you pray that there should be, um, I don't know, rain when there should not be rain, right? Um, then you have to go and you have to go and read, well, obviously there's a lot of laws that are, if let's say, let's keep it very simple. If let's say you add a certain addition into the prayers when it's not meant to be over there, you have to repeat it under certain occasions. Uh, we're not going to get into it, but depending on the different occasions, you have to repeat it. Now why? The answer is because every prayer has a very, very strong effect in the next world. It has a very strong effect, even to the extent that let's say you pray. And let's say you pray that it should rain, but you're like, wait a minute, is it supposed to, I should, I should have said this, should I not have said this? And you're not sure, you're not even sure if you said it, that prayer already registered in the next world. That prayer already registered in the next world, that, to a certain extent that you have to pray again to make sure to know, whatever it is, because it's not supposed to be that time, it's not supposed to be the time for, for, for rain, or it is supposed to be the time for rain. So you have to go and re-pray again to fix that thing, not because of the obligation that you didn't fulfill your commandment of tefillah. And I'll give you an example like this, there was once a guy, there was a certain rabbi, and I forgot who this rabbi was, and he prayed very, very late during the day. Chassidish rabbi prayed very late during the day, uh, and he made sure that ten people would pray with, uh, nine other people prayed with him, only exactly a minyan, because he didn't want people to go and pray, uh, pray late. Also, he wanted only specifically nine. But the, the condition was that you're not allowed to pray beforehand. If you pray beforehand, you're not allowed to be part of the minyan. So, um, one guy, he prayed beforehand, but he was like, you know, let me, let me go into the rabbi's, uh, you know, to the rabbi's minyan. He comes in late to the rabbi's minyan, the rabbi comes in, and he starts praying. He goes in front and he starts praying. Suddenly he stops. He turns around and he starts staring at every single person. And he's looking at them and he's going to the next guy. Looking at them, going to the next guy. Looking at them, going to the next guy. He stops by this guy and he stares at him. And he says, uh, you prayed? And the guy's like, well, like you know, like, well, technically, you know, yeah, like, not really. You know, yes, no, I, whatever. He's like, you did pray. You prayed. He's like, get out. He's like, you're not in here. You get out. And the guy left. And the guy left, he was all smiles. He was so happy. So one of the, one of the people that were there ran over to him and says, I don't understand, the rabbi just kicked you out of the room, you know, because you prayed and you, you, know, you said that you didn't pray. He says, why are you so happy? He says, so the guy answers, he says, you know what type of prayer I had? He says, I don't even realize that I prayed. Like I went through the motions, but I didn't even realize that I actually prayed. And the fact that it registered on his radar, 
That means that my prayer is worth something. That prayer that I didn't even realize worked, did anything. He says, I didn't even realize the words that I was saying. And that registered on his radar. Imagine what it could do in the next one. Like, he's all smiles. He's very happy. So when we look at prayers, even, <laughs> even if... Uh, um, even in yeah, Jewish Disney, right? So even if uh, even if even if you if you say a prayer, you're not even sure if you said it, but it has such an effect that you have to go and you have to correct it for whatever it was. And was it? So okay, but for the same ideas, but if you want to go and dig. Like, like, yeah, so there's a little bit of a different answer to that. Let's speak about that afterwards because we're gonna get what. They do. They, of course, they all have an impact. But she's saying it's not having an impact on the world, um, or so we think, or so we may consider. But anyways, let's move on. We have a lot of uh, a lot to a lot to discuss. So it's so funny. Like out of all the questions that you guys are asking, these are not the questions that I thought you would ask. But okay, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's go with that. Oh, you have? Okay, good. Write it down, kids. Save it for later. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. That's good. That's what everyone should do. Write it down. Okay. Thank you. So um, all right. Where are, where are we? Oh, uh, we said gzeot, we said takanot. Okay, minhagim. Minhagim are customs. Customs that stuck around for a long time and they became a, um, uh, and, and they sort of stayed around that it became a binding religious practice. Here's an example. Um, the second day Yom Tov in diaspora. Outside Al Tisrael, we keep two days of Yom Tov. Now, in Al Tisrael, we don't. Now, originally, this was instituted as a, 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 a decree. What was the decree? The decree was like this. Originally, we wouldn't be able to go and, und- and know, uh, we didn't have a mathematical calendar. The way that we know when the new moon was is when we had two witnesses go and look up into the, um, I shouldn't say we didn't know, we didn't, we didn't use, we didn't utilize a mathematical calendar. We used uh, two witnesses that go and look at the moon. Now, when the, when the witnesses see the new moon, they go and they institute it, they go to the rabbis, the rabbis go and say, okay, listen, the new moon is now. How did, the, how did this information transition to, to everybody else? How did they get this information? So, we know a very famous you know, thing, we're not going to go through all the history with fires on top of mountains, and then they had people, messengers running around, you know, going to tell people, but let's say somebody lived very, very far away from, from Jerusalem. And they instituted their Rosh Kodesh over here. By the time that it got to the outskirts of the outskirts of the outskirts, it could be more than a day. So what the problem was is that the, a lot of times is that people were not sure when to keep certain, certain holidays. They weren't sure because the, the, the information, let's say, didn't come yet. But, uh, you know, I'm not sorry, not more than a day. It could take a long time. It could take a day, you know, they have to take it. But whatever it is, until the information reaches, it could take a very long time. So they weren't sure when, for example, Pesach started. But they knew it had to start either one or two days. Either one or two days it had to start. So just to be sure, they did both days just so that they don't violate it. What happened was, and then we came out with a mathematical calendar. So the Gzirah was no longer applicable. However, the rabbis continued this decree under a minhag, to go and continue it. Why? Excellent question. I know some people had a very big problem with this. We will discuss this, B'zal Hashem, not today, but we'll discuss it in Bible criticism class. This, we will discuss this, uh, uh, this, this topic over there, because I do want to speak about it at length, and we don't have the time uh, to deal with it today. No, no, no. Okay. So what if you're like an American and decide to spend Pesach in, in Israel? Good question, depending on who your rabbi is and you know, yeah. if you own a house in Israel. There's a lot of different things over there. What Generally, if you... Israel is a citizen, two different answers. Well, there's, there's, there's different answers. Yeah, you shouldn't ask two different rabbis. Uh, um, so, it, it generally, if you're going to visit Israel and things like that, you keep both days. But what if you're a citizen there? So you live in Israel? If you move to Israel, no, then you're... I have a citizenship. Yeah, the, I was born there. Just because you have a piece of paper doesn't mean that... Okay. I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on. So that is, so that we just explained, Zerot, Takanot, and Minhagim. Now we have to discuss, when were these decrees made? Like, when did the rabbis institute these decrees? And in fact... If you ask many people, many would say, okay, you know what, recently, you know, like, I, I, actually, if you put it even this way, if you ask Christians, when did they, when did these rabbinic laws, because they're very against, very funny, because they're very against rabbinic laws, but the only laws that they keep, especially the Messianic Jews, uh, Messianic Christians, whatever you want to call them, they are, they actually keep only the rabbinic laws. I think we spoke about this once, uh, once upon a time. But in any case, the, we did, right? The blessings and the Arab, but they keep that. The what? Yeah, they say grace. Yeah. They sit down right before a meal, and they thank God for this meal, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in any case, yeah, um, of course it comes from Judaism. Well, the whole Christianity comes from Judaism and a bunch of other you know, pagan ideologies. But in any case, um, the, the, if you ask the Christians, when did these biblical laws come into play? When did these things come into play? They'll say, after the destruction of the Second Temple. After the destruction of the that's when the rabbis come in into the decree. Now, is that true? Now, of course, if any Christian tells you anything about Judaism, the first thing that you should think about is, is that true? And the second thing you should realize, it's most likely not. Um, and I, the questions that I get 
from, from people that are dealing with Christians or dealing with that. They say, like, you know, this is what they tell me. Is this true? I'm like, they don't know their own religion. Do you think they're going to know about our religion, about Judaism? They don't know even their own Christianity. A lot of them don't even know what they're dealing with, what they're celebrating, when they're celebrating it. They definitely don't know about Judaism. And if they claim that they do, they're definitely misrepresenting the majority of it. So when were these, let's go back to the topic at hand, when were these laws instituted by the rabbis? Let's look at, uh, let's look at some examples. So uh, they actually started way back to the beginning of uh, Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu instituted some, some gzerot. What did he, uh, what did he um, instigate? And some takanot. For example, in Shabbat, page 38, Moshe Rabbeinu instituted seven days of the marriage festivities. That was instituted by Moshe Rabbeinu. He also instituted the seven days of mourning for the dead. Have to institute that, yeah, for the dead, not mourning for after post divorce. Or um, that's usually celebration for some people, but unfortunately, it should be mourning. But in any case, this is the seven days of marriage, seven day of mourning. That was that. In the Ketubot, it says Moshe Rabbeinu went and he instituted the first blessing of Birkat Amazon. He was the one who instituted that. In Megillah, page 32b, he was instituted the obligation to study the laws of the Chagim during the Chag. He also, uh, you know, uh, instituted the decree to read the Torah in public. This was made by Moshe Rabbeinu. Yehoshua, in Bachot, page 48b. Instituted the second bracha of Bekat Amazon. King David, incidentally, by the way, instituted the, the third bracha of uh, Bekat Amazon. If you want to look at that, it's also on Bachot, page 48b. In Abu Zara, page 36b, uh, he made a gzerah. King David made gzerah against Yehud. We'll speak about this hopefully later. Uh, being in seclusion with a um, being in seclusion with a with a uh, single or married uh, woman. The question or woman or for a woman and a man? Yeah, right. Um, true. The Ezra in Babu Kama, page 82a, he instituted, this is during the time of the Anche Knesset Agdola. This is the Shmona Esrei, the Amidah prayer. This was instituted during the, by the way, this is all the time, this is all I'm saying before the destruction of the second temple, which means this is, this is during the temple times or before. Shlomo Amelach, right, during the first temple, he instituted the, of the decree of the Eru. Avraham Yitzhak and Yaakov made the obligation to pray three times a day. Daniel also, we know it has a story that he was praying also. Uh, very briefly, what happened was is that uh, Daniel rose high in the ranks in the government and uh, people didn't want him there. And they realized, how are they going to get him out? They say, listen, they told the king, institute a thing that no one can pray other to the king. Only you can't pray to any other god other than, the, you know, other than the king. And Daniel went and Daniel prayed. So we see over here that even Daniel, during the time of the Bet HaMikdash, he also went and he also uh, you know, had uh, you know, prayers. In Zechariah, chapter, this is one of my favorite, chapter 8, verse 19. It says something very, very interesting. It says the fast of the, it says different fasts. Let me just explain it with Rashi. The fast of the fourth, this is referring to the fourth month of Tammuz. This is uh, uh, the Shavasa Bet Tammuz, the fast that we have that, during now. This is, by the way, this is written in Tanakh. This is not in, this is already when we had prophets. The fast of the fifth, uh, which is the fast of Av, which is the fast of the fifth month. That's, uh, uh, that's uh, Tisha B'Av. The fast of the seventh is referring to the seventh month, which is Tishrei, which is Tzom. Anybody know? Gedalia, very good. And the fast of the tenth, which is the tenth of the month, which is the month of Tevet. Right. Um, uh, at the month of Tevet, of uh, tenth of, right, well, you got the tenth of, yeah, Sarab Tevet, so you're going to that. So you're writing that. Oh, I guess because Nisan is the first. Right. So, yeah. the, so we have over here, you have, you have over here something very interesting. Why is the prophet putting rabbinic fasts in, you know, in, in Tanakh. Tanakh, by the way, it's part of the written Torah. Why is there, and just so that everybody's clear, the 613 mitzvot are not in Tanakh. It's in just the Torah, not in Nach. It's just in the, the 630 commandments are in Chamshe Chamshe Torah, not in the rest of the of Tanakh. Everything else, even if the prophet into something, it's all, it's all rabbinic decrees. It's all rabbinic decrees, all councils are rabbinic. So we see over here, even the prophets, during the prime of prophecy, which means they spoke to God, they dealt with God, they went and they went and they spoke to and they, uh, um, and, and they spoke about these rabbinic laws. Now, this is something very interesting. This is a time when God spoke to the people. God spoke to the prophets. God spoke to many people. So we see here, if it would have been a problem, God would have mentioned something. God mentioned when there was a problem, especially when you're dealing with prophets. But furthermore, not only was it not a problem, this was an obligation for the rabbis and the Sanhedrin and the prophets during that time to institute these decrees, which we'll soon go and, and explain it, you know, more. The Bukhanetza had advisors. Those advisors, was, uh, one of them was Daniel. You look at this, it's in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. It says that Daniel did not want to drink wine from the um, you know, non you know, Jewish wine. The question is why? B biblically, you're allowed to. B biblically, you're not allowed to. So we see over here, even Daniel, even the prophets, they kept the rabbinic law. That had happened during that time. Now, if you ask the Christians, very interesting, if you ask them, say, No, this was made up already then. This was, uh, it was instituted then. 
Um, you, you ask the Christians, you ask them, okay, the prophets, they kept the Torah? They say, yeah, 100%, they kept the Torah. Whatever the prophets keep, you'll keep? Yeah, 100%, you'll keep it. So the prophets kept the rabbinic law. So what do you say to that? The prophets actually, you know, not only kept the rabbinic law, it was actually instituted even before they came into, uh, into play. For example, uh, Kvot Shabbat and Onik Shabbat, this was instituted by the prophet uh, you know, Isaiah, Yeshaya, in chapter 58, verse 13, and through verse 14. And we have many, few, uh, many more examples, but we don't have the time to go and to explain it. Okay, so let's move on. The Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Halevi Rabinowitz said that all major takanot and exilot, they were all instituted prior to, the, prior to the first century common era. Which means is, these, all these decrees that we have, the majority of the decrees, the problem that people have with the rabbis, these were already, majority of them were already all instituted before the destruction of the temple. We already had all these decrees. This didn't come in afterwards. This, didn't come, this was already existence, uh, you know, beforehand. Okay, so now, now we have to ask why, and this is, something, this is where it gets a little bit interesting, why is it that the rabbis had to add it. If it was so important, it was, if it was so imperative for the Torah, why not God just add it during the Torah? Like, why wait till, you know, till, till the rabbis go and institute it? So, I'm going to explain to you how Rabbi Victor Miller explains it. He brings a Gemara in Nazil, page 2.8. It says like this, says that if someone sees a downfall of a woman, which means seeing basically, uh, you know, what... Uh, um, you know, what alcohol, what wine does to her. He makes a vow to refrain from wine. And this, by the way, is a very common tactic, and it's a very good tactic. If, you look, if somebody's interested in, you know, taking drugs, and then you go introduce them to a drug addict that has no more veins to insert drugs to, that he has to insert it into his eyeball, uh, then they go at, yes, that's a thing. Um, then they go, and they'll say, okay, listen, you know, when you see somebody and it's down, you realize, okay, I know I don't want to become like that. When you go... And when you see how an angry person acts and how an angry person reacts, you'll be like, okay, you know what? I got to work on my anger. I definitely don't want to become like that. You know, when you see a gambler, somebody who is going and gambling and, and loses his wife, loses his children, loses his panasa, loses all his money, living in a cardboard box, you know, doing like, you know, like literally lost everything, I'll be like, you know what? Maybe it's not such a good idea to go and gamble besides the, you know, you know prohibitions that, you know, come with it. When, you're, when you see these things, then you go and you refrain from it. Says the Chavot Halvavot on this Gemara, and says if someone sees that his generation is becoming morally corrupt, morally loose, a person has to add extra stringencies upon himself. He explains like this, say, let's say you're walking in a storm. If you're walking in a storm, it's not, a, I'm talking about a real storm. I remember like those storms, that, you know, hurricanes, that if you're walking outside, you, you know, the, you don't even have to worry about the rain falling from, your umbrella is just like here. And, you know, the rain is like coming like over here, and you're like, you know, leaning forward. So if you're walking in a storm, it's not enough just to stand erect, because you'll get toppled over. You have to lean forward to make sure that you don't, get the, you don't get pushed over. So too, if you're in a morally loose generation, a morally loose society, you cannot just be, okay, listen, I'll just keep the throw on that side. You have to add extra stringencies upon yourself so you don't fall, so you don't mess up, in order to preserve, you know, your, you know, the, your, I guess your identity. And this is really what the rabbis instituted. The rabbis, what the rabbis instituted was vital for the the, um, uh, you know, for the, Jew, for, the, for the continuation of the Jewish society as we know it. It says our baby the male explains like this. It explains it regarding uh, baby formula. When the person, when the first person invented, a, you know, the bottle and the baby formula, was that a good invention? Like, it was very nice, you know, it was very good. But, was that, you know, and, and granted, it's a great invention and it helps a lot of people, but was it a good thing for humanity? Was it a good thing for the babies? And we all know that babies, it's much better for the baby to get fed by the mother directly and not to go through a bottle fed. The, the, the nourishment and the warmth, emotionally, nutri nutritionally, there's so many different things that a baby gets so much more when it gets fed directly from the mother than actually from a bottle. But what happened was, is that the, this person saw a need for it. He saw that, you know, the mothers were busy, the mothers weren't able to do it. Whatever reason, some people, you know, you know health, for health reasons, they're not able to go and, and you know, feed the baby. But... Um, so he went and he instituted it. But now that it was like, okay, now it's even better than it was before. It's a bad thing that he needed to invent it. Now that he needed to invent it, okay, at least we have it, and now we have it like that. But it wasn't a good, it wasn't a, I mean, it was a good thing, but it wasn't a positive thing for humanity. You're following me so far? Think of it, uh, another example is compulsory education. Compulsory education is education that is required, that uh, children are required to go and, you know, let's say, go to school. This was, you know, when this was first instituted in the United States? 1852. Massachusetts was the first state to institute a compulsory education. This, until that time, you weren't required to send your child to school. Not private, not public, whatever it is that you want to do, you want to do whatever. It's, it's, it's irrelevant. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't compulsory. All of a sudden, then it became you know, a, uh, a requirement uh, that you have to go and you have to educate the, you know, the, the child and put him into, into school. When was the first time that compulsory education came in in the Jewish law, in the Jewish thing? Very good, excellent. During the time of Shem Bacheta. When, when was uh, the time of Shem Bacheta? 
during the during the sec during the I shouldn't mention okay. So um, let's leave it this way. During the time of the second temple. Second temple. Yeah, yeah, roughly around that time. During the time of the second temple. During the time of the second temple, you're talking about maybe about 150 years before the destruction of the second temple. Uh, Shimon Mechetach and the Kohen Gadol, Yoshua ben Gamla, he saw a need for it, and they went and they instituted compulsory education. That the, you know, that the, there needs to be shivot for the children and so on and so forth. Now the question is, is like, why did it only wait until then? Yes. Why not Moshe Rabbeinu? Like, that should have been instituted right about that. Yoshua should have instituted it, you know. Why are we waiting all the way till then? King David should have, Shlomo Amar, the wisest of all men. Why didn't he institute it? Kids weren't learning anything? Ah, good or question. They didn't just know. They didn't They're just know. Very good. They were, it says, Vishinam, the Torah says like this, Vishinam tam levanecha. There was, a, yeah, there was an obligation, an obligation from the parents. The father had an obligation, Vishinam tam levanecha. You have to go and teach your child. You have to teach your child the way of the Torah. During the time before Shem and there was no need for a compulsory education. There was no need for schools because the father taught them everything. The father lived, the family, the home lived and breathed Torah. This is what they dealt with. This is what they did. The, you know, it was a very sad day that they needed to introduce this. Because that means that, number one, either the parents were negligent in teaching their children, or they weren't able to anymore. Why did this happen during the time of the, second, the end of the second temple? Because this is the time when we had Sadukim. They came, they infiltrated the, the Beth Midash, they infiltrated the thing, and they, they, you know, they ruined a lot of things. And because of that, the people were no longer able to go and educate their children the right way. Shem ben Shetach saw this, Yeshua ben Gamla saw this, and said, we need to institute something. So then it became a compulsory you know, education started for the Jewish society. It wasn't a good thing. It was a very sad day that this happened, but it was needed. It was very unfortunate that it was needed. And that's why it didn't, it didn't happen at a, previous, uh, you know, at a previous time. The same idea is in Devarim, chapter 17, verse 14. It says that when the, when the Jewish nation, to put a king over the Jewish nation, it says something very interesting. It says, the amalta, when you say that you want a king, that's when you're going to get a king. The question is why? Since when do we have any mitzvah in the Torah that says, oh, when you want it, that's when it's going to become an obligation to you. That's when we have a king. Why is it? Why is it for to have a king is only obligation only when the Jewish people want it, but the Jewish people ask for it? And the answer is, we look at Shoftim, chapter 25, verse 15. It says, by Amimahem and Amalek Israel. During those times, there was no king in Israel. Ish hayashal be'enav yaseh. Every person did what's right in his eyes. There was no need to have a king. There was no need to have an organized government. There was no purpose for this. The people did what's right. And it was a very sad time when we needed the king, because that's when we needed organized government. We needed to have this. You look at a guy who goes, uh, who goes to, let's say, learning Torah. For, you know, he's 50 years old, and he's learning Torah in Kolo. You don't need to have somebody go in there, check his attendance, because he's there because he wants to. Right? They're not doing it for the money, I'll tell you that much. Right? They're not going in there. So they're, they're doing it because they want to. When you're, you know, children need attendance, because they don't want to be there. It, it's a, it's, it was a very, very sad time when these things needed to be uh, instituted. The Shlach Kodesh says like this, in Shnei Luchot he says like this, he says that there are 365 prohibitions of the Torah, that is, that, is, uh, that is something to fight the poison of the evil inclination. This is supposed to fight the poison of the evil inclination. When the poison increases, we need to increase the antidote for it. So during the time, and he uses basically the Asu Mishmatem Nishmati, this is the, the verses that we mentioned before, that when the, the Yetzirah goes, and we know before Mashiach comes, and before even, you know, since begin, you know, as the time goes on, the generation goes further and further away, the Yetzirah gets even stronger and stronger and stronger. There is, now that you have all this more poison, you have to have more antidote for it. You have to have more into it. More into it. The, the, and we'll go, let's go through, through maybe two, three more examples, and we'll, we'll close it off. Uh, we'll open up for questions. The... We said we're going to speak about uh, Yehud. So I want to speak about Yehud. David HaMelech. So the, the obligation of Yehud. What's Yehud? Yehud is you now to be in seclusion, uh, um, you know, with uh, the opposite gender. So a, a man and a woman is now to be secluded together in a private and closed place. The biblical prohibition was only for married women. Dove, King David went and instituted this also for single people. Now why did they institute it for single people? Because of a scenario that happened between Amnon and, his, and, and Tamal. He's, there was a situation that happened and Amnon had, you know, ended up dying. It was a long story. He ended up dying because of that, you know, of, of a situation like that. He saw the need for it and he went and he, and he instituted, instituted it. So these things, when we look at these things, you're, you're, it's the reason why it wasn't instituted in the beginning, because it wasn't needed. It wasn't needed. Nobody needed these things. It was only when people needed it. Now all of a sudden we need to, we need to go and we need to, uh, we need to institute it. The Rabbi Victor Miller goes and says, you know, like when you're dealing in now generation, Yehud is so important. Because how many problems happen, happen with these things? There are so many. He says, he says, if you think like this, if you think, let's say, if women and men would dress and act properly, then, and the, and the men would be learning misilat yisharim, they'd be learning the ways that are fear of heaven, then okay, you know, they, they, you know, they, they, you know, there's something else. 
He says, but even those type of men that have all that and they go and they get secluded with a woman in private, he says, you don't, you don't, you can't, you can't, you know, who knows what could happen, in, in, you know, during this, uh, during this, uh, you know, thing. And, and he says, Rabbi Vigna Mela goes and says like this, he says, you know, he says, back in a certain time, business was meant to be business. Now, when someone hires, and this is Rabbi Victor Miller's words, but I agree with it 100%. He says, when somebody would hire a secretary, for example, or any other woman in the office, um, she does her best, you know, let me quote it for you. She undresses her best and comes to work. That's what she does. She makes sure that she's the most immodest possibly, and then, oh, this is the most immodest I can do. Why do you think we had, even the Goyim have to institute dress codes now all of a sudden? Why do they have to institute dress codes all of a sudden, in, in, you know, in these things? Now, when you're living in this type of situation, you need to go and you need to protect yourself. You need to protect yourself. There's so much more. Sister Rabbi Vigda Miller says, you know, we, have, we make a blessing, Shalas Ani Goy. He didn't make me a, you know, a guy. He says, you know what, there's so many reasons you do it. But you know one big reason why you should do it? Because we have the laws of Yehud. He says, you know how much problem these things prevent if people follow it? How many families are lost? How many businesses are lost? How many situations were, were, were disrupted because of the problem of Yehud? He says, this is the best thing that could happen to the Jewish people. All these rabbis, that they did these things, they are protecting, not only they're protecting, they're helping you to the, the extent that you don't even understand. It says Rabbi Vigdemil, it goes on, it says, you know, a, a person once tried to persuade him. It said like this, Ramban Rambam Nishmona Prakim says like this. It says, do not say that I hate pork. Say, I like pork, but what can I do? The Torah forbids it. That's what the Rambam says. Says this man to, the, to, to Rabbi Victor Miller, he says, no, you know what, we should say this also about immorality. He says, you know, that, oh, the Torah says, you know, that immorality is good. But no, I would love immorality. But what can I do? The Torah says that it's, that, that it's not good, and hence, you know, I can't do it. But I really want to do it, but I can't do it because the Torah says that. Says Rabbi Victor Miller, this is a very, very incorrect interpretation of the, of the Rambam. What it means is, what the Gemara means like this. It says that... Really, you, you shouldn't say that pork in itself is disgusting and detestable. Rather, you should say, it may taste good. But what can you do? The Torah forbids it. But now that the Torah forbids it, I have to make sure and I have to feel disgusted by it. I have to go and stay away from it. And this is a lot of people, people, people don't understand this. And uh, the victim, he really explains it very, you know, like, people have a very, very strong understanding that, no, I want to do a sin, but I can't do a sin. He says, no, now that the Torah says you can't do a sin, you should make it that you don't even want to do the sin. You should build yourself to a level that you don't want to do a sin. Now you should go and smell pork and be like, oh, yes, yes, you know. Okay, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, you're not supposed to put yourself in those types of, of situations. Now, David Amalek went and instituted Tehillim. If it was so important, why did Moshe Rabbeinu do it? There's so many other people that did it, they needed to do it beforehand. And the answer is, you know, you look at Tefillah. It says it was a slap in the face if you would have told the people, in the, uh, you know, in the, during the time of the, before the temple, you know, you know the, the, during the, right after the Torah was given, oh, you have to pray to God like this. Are you serious? It says the, the, the entire prayer was filled with enthusiasm. It was a filled of connection to God. They didn't need this. They didn't need these things. And today, even with these things, we can't pray properly. Okay, but give me a break, okay? They saw a lot of miracles happen, okay? So it's a little different. True, but they also had black magic, so they didn't know where it came from. Still, they're lucky. Okay, I'm just saying. Zelu came says in Kohelet. Everything was done in the, in the same level. It's true, we live in a different time, as it's true, but don't think, um, just because you think that their time is easier, it may, yeah, it may not. And if it and granted, we do have more tests. We do have more tests nowadays, that's true. But you should know that, you know, it says, you know, even Menashe brings down in the Gemara that he says, that, you know, to big rabbis, he says, if you were during the time of my time, the temptation that we had to serve idolatry, you would have lifted your robes to go and run after idolatry. He says, we don't understand the temptations that they had either. Granted, we have different temptations today than they had. But again, different times, different, obviously, you know, only God knows, uh, you know, these, uh, you know these, these situations. But the, when we look at these things and we look at the laws of the rabbis, these, you know, people very much misunderstand it. You, you're, you're looking at it, this, the reason why it wasn't instituted from the beginning, because it wasn't needed in the beginning. People were on such a level, they didn't need it. It was a slap in the face if you would have did it. Now all of a sudden, the rabbis saw that people are falling off, people are going and they were violating the biblical commandments, they were violating things, they were getting radioactive material attached to them, they were going and getting cancerous diseases, you know, spiritually speaking, so we've got to do something to protect them. Not because, oh, we want to go and cause them hardship and we want to cause them more problems. Because of how much they cared and how much they needed and how much... Uh, there's two ways to look at things. There's the way you could look at things as, um, as, as a negative way and you could look at it as, as a, positive way, a positive way. When you're in a relationship, there are a set of rules. Every relationship has a set of rules. The stronger the relationship, the more the rules are. That's the way that it works. And we're in this very strong relationship with God. This, there obviously is going to come on rules. You can't be married and say, hey, listen, you know, this doesn't apply to me. I'm going to do whatever I want on Tuesdays to Thursdays. You know, after that, that, I mean, that doesn't work that way. You have, you're in a relationship, you have a set of rules. The same idea is what we're dealing with over here. Now, if, you're, if you have a problem, if the generation is going and there's problematic with it, then yeah, if you have a problem with gambling, don't go to Atlantic City. Don't go to Vegas. Well, that's period, ever. But I'm saying, even especially if you have a, a gambling you know, problem, you don't put yourself in situations. If you have a problem of looking at the internet, looking at bad things, put a filter on. Even if not, you should still put a filter on the internet. 
A person has to know themselves, a person has to put their own fences. But even more so, during the time of the rabbis, they went and they instituted these things for a very, very strong benefit. And many people don't understand that. They think the rabbis, I don't know what they, they, they don't even know what they think. Because when I ask them, they don't know what, what's actually going on. But now let's, the, let's, let's finish off with one point. And the final point is, is, who are these rabbis that instituted these things? Like, who are these, like, you know, people, you think, okay, rabbis. The, the rabbi says the, the Rambam. The Rambam in the laws of Hilchot Sanhedrin, chapter 2. Halacha 8 says, these rabbis, who are the rabbis? The rabbis are wise, obviously. They're sin-fearing, they're humble, modest, they have a good reputation, they're beloved by people, they have a high level of righteousness. You know, and to be in a Sanhedrin, you have to know all the languages. You couldn't, you know, Mandarin, Cantonese, whatever they spoke back then, in all the different languages, you had to know all the languages. Why? Because if somebody came and testified, you couldn't use the testimony of another, uh, you know, of interpreter. You have to, you, you know, there's a lot of things that come into play when you listen to somebody, the way that they speak, the way that they say things, words that may get lost in translation. So they knew all, you're talking about people not on the same level, to, to the extent, you, this is, and by the way, the rabbis were not like, it wasn't like a political power. You had, you know, where, where it's like fame, money, honor, all these things went. You had people, for example, during the time in, in Babel, Hillel. Hillel was a wood chopper, right? Not the most prestigious profession. And he became the top, top rabbi. He became the top, top rabbi. You had Rabbi Akiva, a poor shepherd, that became the top rabbi. It doesn't depend on who you come from, what money you come from, all these things. It depends on what you accomplish and who you are as a person, as an individual. Spiritually, physically, uh, you know, and everything in between. You have over here, this is, this is who you're dealing with. You're not dealing with, you have also, there's a Gemara, um, and you can look also in, uh, in Rosh Hashanah, page 25a, there, um, there was, and we spoke about this idea, you know, previously, Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua was, was he knew astrology very, very well. So, you know, one time he was traveling, and with Rabbi Gamliel, on a boat, and this we mentioned before, and they knew that there was a certain amount of time that it would take them to travel to a certain destination, and they each prepared a certain amount of food. Rabbi Shua prepared more. And when Rabbi Gamliel, when he, when he, you know, he finished his food, he says, how do you know to prepare more food? He says, every 70 years there's a certain star that comes out that misguides the sailors, and I figured this is the time that it's going to come out. If the sailors use that star, we're going to get detoured, and we're going to take longer than necessary, hence I brought more food. This, so this is a rabbi, and by the way, um, Rabbi Shua Rabbi lived in 19, 1790 to 1867, he was the chief rabbi of Prague. He said that this is Haley's Comet, which means as he instituted, he already found, yeah, yeah, I, I, that's what I mentioned before. We, the, the Haley's Comet, this was already, already found by a rabbi well before Edmund, uh, you know, Haley came to the picture. But in any case, we see over here a rabbi that was very well versed in astrology, to the extent that he knew things that the sailors and the other rabbis didn't know. Now, when, the, when this particular rabbi that was with him, that uh, um, they instituted a certain time when Rosh Chodesh was, because of when the moon, you know, came and they had witnesses, so the Nasi Rabbi Gamliel said, okay, we're instituting Rosh Chodesh over here. Rabbi Shua says, no, I don't agree. According to my calculations, and this was an astrology expert. This is the one who knew when the stars are coming out. He knew when this thing, he says, no, according to my calculations, it shouldn't be now. Rabbi Gamliel says, nevertheless, you know, I, you know, this is the, you know, the, the, their testimony is good, and I'm still making it, uh, you know, uh, you know, during, this is Rosh Chodesh, I'm during this time. Says Rabbi Gamliel to Rabbi Shua, I says, furthermore, he says, so he says, I want you, on the time when you think it's Yom Kippur for you, you're going to walk to me with a stick. You're going to carry on Yom Kippur to me on the day that you think it's Yom Kippur. Because that's why, you know, because he, it would have been the 10th, but he, but basically he said, he, would, he says, I want you to go on the 11th day of, of um, you know, 11th day of the month. I want you to come and I want you to go and walk uh, with, a, with, you know, carry basically on Yom Kippur with your walking stick and, uh, um, you know, whatnot. So Rabbi Shua was very bothered by that. So Rabbi Akiva went comfort, you know, comfort him and say, listen, he says, the, the Rosh Chodesh really depends only on the sages. Whenever the sages instituted, that's when the Rosh Chodesh is. And he went, and he went on, this is a, one of the biggest rabbis, who had, you know, the, probably the best in astrology. He knew what he was talking about. During when he thought Yom Kippur was, he went and he carried him and went right in front of the rabbi. The rabbi got up, kissed him, and says, my rabbi. That's what he called him, my rabbi. He says, you know, there, again, there's a lot of stories, that, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, explanations that we can speak about, about this story, but we're dealing with somebody, the level of humility, can you understand that? When you're the expert, and someone tells you, you're going to listen to me, because this is the way that we're deciding right now, and you're not only going, you listen, but you go and you walk to that person. You, you don't understand the level of humility that is needed. These are the rabbis that you're dealing with. You know, and, I, and I'll finish off. I, I don't know if I said ever this story online. And I, and I was thinking if I ever should or if I ever shouldn't. But I'll tell you the story. This is a personal story of me with Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky during nowadays. So um, there was somebody that I knew that was, that was very, very sick. And I went over to, when I was in Israel, I went over to Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky. And I asked him, um, I asked him two things. And... One of the, you know, and uh, one of the things was for for washing them out for this sick person, and um, the rabbi gave me a blessing on one thing. They didn't mention anything on the sick person, 
So I thought maybe then here I asked it again. I, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, I asked it again. And again, he didn't mention anything. I thought, you know, he's an older guy. Maybe he's not hearing. Okay, fine. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to pressure this. And he just completely ignored when I asked him to, to for a flush off for a certain person. And then um, a few months after I went, a few, it was about four months after that, the person passed away. And I went to the Shiva house. And I overheard one of the family telling that they went over to Reb Chaim Kanievsky and they gave him the name and Reb Chaim Kanievsky didn't answer. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, that happened to me also. And I went and we were speaking to him. I'm like, did this happen? And he was like, yeah. He says, I mentioned, uh, you know, I mentioned the name and he didn't answer me. He says, Reb Chaim Kanievsky didn't answer me when I said this, this particular name. And, and, you know, and this guy, he says, he, says he, he, he was a brother-in-law of the, of, the, of the person that passed away. He said right then he knew that, it, it, you know, that it, that's it. That, that's, you know, the, it's finished. And you know, he didn't say anything, but he says, when he realized that, he, I didn't even put the two and two together. But now all of a sudden we had two people that went over to a big rabbi, biggest rabbi you know, one of the biggest rabbis in the world alive today. Today, during our time and age, went over to him and said somebody who was sick, just gave a name. That's it. No background information, no diseases, no nothing, just a name. Refused to say anything on it. Now, if the rabbis nowadays have this type of, you know, ability, you know, imagine what the rabbis of the yesteryears had. Imagine what the level was back then. So what we're dealing with, we're not dealing with just rabbis who are sitting, you know, eating sushi and trying to, you know, figure out what they're going to do. You're dealing with the top of the top, the humble, the humility, the only cure. They devote their entire life to God and to the Jewish people. They don't do anything else other than devote their life. Now, it's not... You know, there's no money in these things. There's, no, there's nothing other than you're doing it. The only reason that you're doing it for, well, nowadays maybe a little bit different, but the majority, the back then, the only reason that you're doing it for is only for the goodness of your heart because you want to help the Jewish people and you want to go and do things for God. There's nothing else associated other than that. Now when you have these type of people that they're telling you to do something, there's a reason to do something. They care for you. They love you. They care about you. They're rabbis that if they, you tell them their hardship, they sit and they cry with you. When was the last time you told somebody about it? Your best friend. You told them about your biggest problem. They're like, wow, I feel so bad for you. So listen to what happened to me the other day, right? So I was shopping and then I looked at whatever, you know, it just goes back into them. But when you're dealing with somebody you never met before, you tell them your heart. Nowadays, these are rabbis nowadays that they sit and they're going to cry with you. These are not rabbis that are looking to make your life more reasonable. These are rabbis that only care about the Jewish people and God. And when they're instituting something, there's a reason why they're instituting it. There's a very, very important reason behind it. And it's very, very imperative that we follow it. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.